Um, hi guys, uh, and welcome to the last international dinner. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, hope you guys enjoy the food. If, if if you have no food yet, then it will come to you very soon. Sorry for the delay. Um, yeah. And thanks so much for uh, all the people who gave up their afternoon uh, to cook food for us. Uh, food don't just appear for themselves, and it's not easy to feed for like 100 people for five days. So thank you so much. Um, and we, we don't do this just because we are nice people. Uh, we do this because we know that there's a savior who loves us. And uh, therefore, we want to love other people, which relate to our topic today. Uh, Today's topic is uh, Uncover Love, Why Does Jesus Matter? And now I'm going to invite the speaker. Hi, um, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, <laughs> is How do I switch on? Is it working? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, what was the question? Uh, would you like to introduce yourself, your name and what you, what you do, and etc. Okay, I'm Pauline, and I work with a Christian charity that send people around the world to tell them about Jesus. Okay, um, what's your favorite country? My favorite country, uh, well, Senegal is very close to my heart. I lived in Senegal for seven years, so it has a very special place in my heart. Okay, hope you guys enjoy the talk. Hi everyone, it's very bright up here. Um, is, is there anybody in the room from Japan or speak Japanese? Okay, I'm safe. This word, kintsuji, anybody know what that is? Maybe. It's actually the Japanese art of repairing broken pottery. And they use a special lacquer and they mix it with gold, powdered gold, or powdered silver, powdered platinum to make a special glue. And they get all the broken pieces and glue it back together so that it looks a bit like this. And the philosophy is that actually if something's broken, we can mend it and celebrate the fact that it used to be broken and instead of trying to make the repair invisible, we make it visible and make it part of the new beauty of the pot. Taking something that's broken, making it beautiful, making it useful and more valuable than the original. That's what kintsuji is. And when I heard about this, I really loved that concept. I thought it was really, really good. And it spoke to me about uh, a little bit about what we're going to talk about this evening. On Wednesday, if you were here, you would have heard Malcolm talking about sin and how sin separates us from God and, and therefore sin is a big problem. Sin leads to all sorts of brokenness, brokenness in our lives, brokenness in the lives of those around us, brokenness in the world, in our relationships. It's all around us, isn't it? And I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone in, in saying that my heart aches for the brokenness that I see all around me. And we long to see it mended, don't we? Well, the good news is that brokenness can be mended. And um, my, my topic, this, the, the title for this talk that I was asked to give is Why Does Jesus Matter? And the short answer to that question, Why Does Jesus Matter?, is that he is the only one who can mend the brokenness. He's the only one who can sort out this separation from God problem that sin creates. <clears throat> so to find out about why Jesus matters, it's important to look and find out about the life of Jesus. And on your table, you have a book which is called Uncover, and in it you'll find part of the Bible, a part of the Bible that talks about the life of Jesus. It's a, a manuscript that's been tested, it's reliable, it's first eye, eyewitness evidence of the life of Jesus. And so it's a good place to start to find out about him. What did he say? What did he do? 
And the man who wrote the book of Mark was a man called John Mark. And he was writing to Jews, and he, he made some very bold claims about Jesus in his writing. And you can follow along with me if you want to, if you want to open up, open up your Bible. I know you're all eating, so you probably can't do two things at once. But check it out afterwards when, when you get chance to. Um, because he starts off in verse 1. The, the book of Mark is in the first 90 pages of your little book there. So if you want to follow it, on page 1 or 2 in chapter 1, Mark says that Jesus was the Messiah. So bang, straight in there, he makes that bold claim. Jesus was the Messiah. Now to the Jews, they knew exactly what he meant. They've been waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah had been promised and prophesied for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so they knew what he meant. And so that would have immediately meant something to him. The Messiah was somebody who was going to deliver them. So they were excited about that. They were expecting him and they were longing for him because they were under the rule of the Roman Empire and it wasn't a nice rule to be under. So they were longing for somebody to come and rescue them from that. Also, in verse 1, Mark says that Jesus was the Son of God. That's quite a bold claim. In verse 3, he says that he calls him Lord. Again, another bold claim. Somebody with power and authority. In verse 4, it talks about John the Baptist coming to prepare a way for him. So somebody needed to come to prepare a way for this person. He must be pretty significant and pretty important. Elsewhere in the Bible, it says that Jesus was the per a perfect person. He never did anything wrong. He never sinned. Towards the end of his life, he was arrested and put on trial. But even at his trial, they couldn't find anything to accuse him of. They told lots of lies about him, but they couldn't actually find a crime that he'd committed. So he was a very significant, a very important person that lived and walked on the earth. But so what? What did he say? What did he do that was so important? Well, he came to bring this new kingdom that they'd been waiting for. The only trouble was it wasn't quite the kingdom that they wanted or they were expecting. They were expecting a military ruler to come and overthrow the Romans and establish a new kingdom. But he wasn't a military ruler. In fact, he didn't say, I'm going to change the Roman rule. I want you to change, is what he said. He said, God has to be first. That's the most important thing. That's the way to live, is to have God as the number one most important. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Not half-heartedly, wholeheartedly. And then, after God, love other people. That's the order. God, other people, then yourself. And by other people, he, met, he called other people your neighbor. Well, who are your neighbor? He told the story of the Good Samaritan. The Samaritans were the arch enemies of the Jews. So he was saying, love your enemies. Love the people that society has cast out. So he spent time hanging out with people that society had shoved to the edge. People with leprosy, prostitutes, tax collectors. Those are our neighbors and those are the people we should love. He demonstrated his power over the physical realm, over the spiritual realm, over the natural realm. He, he did amazing things. He healed sicknesses. He raised people from the dead. He delivered people from evil spirits. Even the natural world did as he, did as he told them. The wind and the waves were calm at his command. He took five little bits of bread and two little fish and fed. 5,000 people. Amazing. He walked on water. So his power and authority was unquestioned. But he didn't pack a punch either. He, he told it as it was, and he criticized people for, for behaving badly. The religious leaders got it particularly bad because they were very hypocritical and judgmental, and he said they shouldn't be, and he told them off. He encouraged characteristics such as love and forgiveness, grace. Those 
should be the characteristics of people in his kingdom. What's on the inside is more important than what's on the outside. Our heart has to change. He demonstrated a lifestyle of prayer. He invited people to follow him. He was a wonderful teacher. He used stories and illustrations from everyday life to teach his spiritual principles. He was an excellent teacher. And he got lots of different reactions. Some people were amazed. Some people were delighted. Some people were a bit confused because this isn't what they were expecting at all. Some people were downright angry. But he caused a stir and he didn't go unnoticed. Most importantly, he died. You might think that's a bit strange. Why is that really important? Well, because, as Malcolm explained on Wednesday, sin is a really big problem because it separates us from God. We were, we were created and designed to live in relationship with God. That's what the Bible tells us. But sin stops that from happening. And it damages us. It damages other people. Sin is just a little tiny word, but it means all the wrong in the world that stems really from an attitude of what I want is the most important thing. Putting me first is really at the root of every sin, isn't it? If we stop and think about it, from the big sins that we think of as big sins, like murder or rape, right down to the things that we think are not so big, like telling lies or getting angry or lashing out at somebody. Really, the root of it is what I want is the most important thing. And God can't tolerate the big sin or the small sin. It's all sin to him, and he can't tolerate it because he's holy and perfect. He can't tolerate it. And the Bible says that the penalty for sin is death. Because God's not only holy, he's just as well. And so a just God has to punish wrong. Otherwise, he wouldn't be just. So if we all sin, what hope is there? There's no hope because it's impossible for us to be perfect. But God isn't just a holy God and a just God. He's also a God of love. And because he loves us so much, he doesn't want the separation. So to make it possible for us not to be separated, he sent his son, Jesus, to be the perfect sacrifice that we need. I don't know how to use this thing. Is it working? Where do I point it? Oh, there we go. So Jesus came as the substitute That's why he came. The Bible says, we are made fit for God by the once for all sacrifice of Jesus. Christ made a single sacrifice for sins, and that was it. It was a perfect sacrifice by a perfect person to perfect some very imperfect people. By that single offering, He did everything that needed to be done for everyone who takes part in the purifying process. And he said, I'll forever wipe the slate clean of sin. That's why Jesus matters, because he makes that possible. His death wasn't an accident. It wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't a, oh dear, that wasn't meant to happen. His death was predicted and prophesied about hundreds and hundreds of years before and many, many times. So he was fulfilling what had already been foretold. He took all the punishment that should be ours. And because of that, we can be forgiven. For all the sin, for all the things that we've done wrong, we can be forgiven right now, today. But he didn't just die... If you read right to the end of Mark, you'll find out that actually he rose again as well. And that's really important because in rising again, coming back from the dead, he actually broke the power of sin. So we don't have to live under that, the grip of sin anymore. 
if we choose not to. We can choose to live under a different authority. So why does that matter to me, to you, today? That was 2,000 years ago. Well, if Jesus was the Messiah then, if he was the Son of God then, and if what he taught and told people to do then was true, then it's, then it's true today as well. It's actually the most important question you will ever grapple with in your life. If you're wondering, was Jesus a liar? Was he a lunatic? Or was he, as he claimed to be, Lord? Which one? If you're not sure, can I encourage you, please, to really wrestle with that question and find out the answer? Because it is the most important question of your life. Because the whole of your eternity depends on it. C.S. Lewis wrote a book, a really good book, called Mere Christianity, which tackles that very question. Was Jesus a liar, a lunatic, or Lord? So that would be a good place to start. So the question is, do you want to be right with God? That's a really good question to ask. Do you want to accept his gift of forgiveness and the invitation that he gives us to follow him. In chapter 1 of Mark, of Mark's gospel, Jesus himself said, repent and believe the good news. That's how to get right with God, is to repent. Very simple, but very profound. What does repent mean? It's It's a bit of a religious word, isn't it, repent? But it just means to say, Sorry, to feel sincere regret or remorse about something. To feel sorry for all the sin that's offended and separated us from God. And it's to also desire to live differently from now on. That's what repent means. A desire to live God's way instead of our way. It's coming with humility and surrender before God and saying, yeah, I recognize I need you. I need your forgiveness and I want to live your way. And it's choosing to come under a different authority. You might be wondering, this umbrella isn't here because it's raining. I saw this illustration recently and I really liked it. Choosing to follow Jesus is actually choosing to put yourself under the authority of God. When you're under the authority of God, you you can benefit from all the benefits of being under the authority of God. One of them is forgiveness from sin and being made right with God. Another one is healing from on the brokenness. Or we can choose not to. We can choose to remain under the authority and the grip of sin if we choose to. It's one or the other. If you choose to come under the authority of God, then you can enjoy the benefits of being under that authority. One of those benefits is joy, no matter what the circumstances. Who wants that? Peace, even in the midst of a storm. Who wants that? As well as the forgiveness, as well as the healing. It's a no-brainer. So if you want to be healed from the brokenness, then I encourage you to invite Jesus into your life. Last night, Shelley was here and she told her story. If you were here, you would have heard her powerful story about how she invited Jesus into her life and what a difference that made. I invited Jesus into my life when I was, well, first of all, when I was seven, I grew up in a Christian family. But then when I went to university, just at the stage of life you are now, I began to live in a way that wasn't at all honouring to God. And I realised I was being very hypocritical. And it came to a bit of a crossroads in my life. And I thought, well, I can't call myself a Christian and live in this way. So I explored for myself again, is Jesus real? And is he somebody I want to give my life to? 
And I chose, yes, I do, because he's amazing. And I love my job because I get to send people all around the world and make sure that as many people as possible get to hear about him. Many people in this room have also decided, yes, I want to follow Jesus. But the thing is, he doesn't force it on us. It's, it has to be our choice. You can take it or leave it. If you want to accept this offer of, of forgiveness and being made right with God, you can do it right now, today. And I'll lead you through that in a minute. But you might be thinking, actually, no, I'm not ready for that. Or I'm not sure. There'll be some time in a minute to talk about it around the table. But please, if you're not sure or you're thinking no, I urge you to reconsider and to really research, ask questions, read, find out who is this Jesus and is he really who he says he was. But if you are ready to, to say, yes, I want to accept Jesus, then it's really simple. First of all, you just have to acknowledge that you sin, that you do wrong things, that you're sorry for that and you want to do, you want to live differently and invite him into your life. And he'll come by his Holy Spirit. He'll come and be with you forever. And then he'll lead you on this journey of making you whole. So let's pray. I'm going to pray a prayer. It's not a magic prayer. It, it's just some words that if, you're, if you would like to do this, then just pray it in your heart or in your head or out loud, up to you. And then afterwards, come and talk to somebody about it. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, I need you. I'm so sorry for all that I've done and said and thought that has offended you, that's damaged myself and others. Thank you for dying on the cross to take the punishment for me. I receive you as my saviour and my Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and for the promise that I will never be separated from you. I open the door of my life and invite you in. I want you to take control and to help me live the way you want me to. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So there's a few minutes now. So at your table, just talk about what you've heard. Maybe something's captured your interest or something's provoked you to think, I don't, I don't agree with that. Whatever. But take some time just to talk about something that you've heard this evening. And if you want to come and talk to me, that's fine, or any of the other people around the table. But don't go away from here without really thinking, why does Jesus matter today? <laughs>